Hello and welcome to the St. Nicholas Summer Series 2021, a series of four experts sharing their expertise and connecting it to this wonderful 1,141 year old building that we are now in. Our first speaker is Dr. Alex Bond, a senior curator in charge of birds at the Natural History Museum in London and ornithologist in residence at St. Nicholas Church. Hi Alex, it's great to kind of have you with us. Hi Jay, it's brilliant to be here, thank you so much. Just before we start Alex's talk, um, I just think it's important to warn everybody that due to the nature of Alex's work in sustainability and conservation, he will be showing some videos of dead birds and some people may find that distressing, but it's not in a gratuitous way and you can just speed past them if you need to. So over to Alex, take it away. Thanks very much, Jay. Thanks everyone for joining. It's a great pleasure, a privilege and pleasure to join you today to talk about some of the research that we've been doing around plastics. And I think, you know, that has a really neat relationship with St. Nicholas because, you know, plastics have only really been around for the last, you know, just over 150 years, which is obviously a minority of the time that St. That Nicholas has been in existence. So it really frames the severity of this problem and how fast um, it's crept up on us as a society in a, in a very unique and different way. Um, but as, uh, as the title might imply, it's a rather queer journey in the study of plastic pollution. Um, and like all journeys, it starts with the I'm ready for my close-up Mr. DeMille uh, picture. Uh, so this is me, age about seven. Um, I grew up in Eastern Canada uh, in you know, sort of small communities. It's a very conservative part of the country. Um, and what I want to try and convey with, with some of this talk is how my own I guess, trajectory um, has mirrored how we approach the problem of plastic pollution. Um, for me, my, my first sort of big awakening, if you can call it that, was the American series Queer as Folk, which was obviously based on, based on the British series. And that aired in Canada from 1999 to 2005. And that was the first real honest depiction of LGBTQ plus characters in the media. And we've got, you know, there's obviously quite a few more examples now, but, you know, 22 years ago, um, this was a very novel and, and risque thing to do. And if you look at the sort of the broader societal um, views at the, point, at, at the time, um, this is a woman named Elsie Wayne. She was a Canadian member of parliament for St. John in New Brunswick, which is where I'm from. Um, she was also the mayor of St. John, and I danced with her at my aunt's wedding in about 1990. Um, she was also one of the most staunch opponents of equal marriage in Canada when we were having this public debate uh, 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, back then we didn't have Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, thank goodness. Um, we had the op-ed sections of our local newspapers. Um, and so from the Telegraph Journal in St. John, New Brunswick, they asked in 2003, um, why do you oppose same-sex marriage? Uh, you know, and it violates and discriminates the rights of the straight community uh, to honour their time-honoured cultural heritage. It denies every child in Canada the right to a father and a mother. The sight of two men kissing and talking about sex is repulsive to me, and I can't help it. It's just the way that God made we know that these arguments hold no weight for a whole variety of reasons. But this was the public debate that was going on at the time. And it was rather a lot. Um, you know, um, there were, for me, there were a couple of really defining moments. Um, so we've got uh, up in the, the top right corner is a chemistry lab instructor from Alberta named uh, Delwyn Vreen. And it was his case uh, for being fired, for being gay, that uh, in 1997 read into the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, specifically protections for queer people in employment. And this was sort of the first real legal win because it enshrined that protection in in Canada what is one of our foundational constitutional documents 
Um, and then, of course, uh, there was uh, in Laramie, Wyoming in 1998, the terrible case of Matthew Shepard, who was a 21-year-old college student who was tied to a fence and beaten ultimately to death um, because he was gay. And this was the first case of that sort of thing capturing sort of the broader media attention. Yes, it had definitely happened before. But, you know, you had you know, regular reports on American media. It was turned into this play by Moises Kaufman and the Tectonic Theater Project called The Laramie Project. Um, and it, it was a real watershed um, in the late 1990s. However, you know, today we think, you know, things are much better. And indeed, that is the case. But we still have quite a long ways to go. Um, this is an excerpt from an email that was sent to me from a colleague who put uh, uh, an email out to their institution asking for more diverse seminar speakers for their, their research series. Um, and this was one of the responses. Isn't it the individual and not the group, the only ethical and moral consideration to be had? Um, otherwise, by implication, there would be a white, patriarchal, heterosexual, oppressive plot in place. Well, yes, there is. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of the point. Um, and surely the oppressors and conspirators can be brought to justice. I mean, somebody who just, just did not at all grasp this. As part of one of the organizations that I help run called LGBTQ plus STEM, which looks to promote and support LGBTQ plus people working in science, technology, engineering, and maths, we have a one day science conference, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But we also help run an event called LGBT STEM Day, um, which started on Twitter a few years ago. And some of the responses you get to that, even just a couple of years ago, are just, it just boggles the mind. And it shows, you know, how little some things have actually changed. Um, you know, you're, according to your calendar, you have a month of festivity plus one day in July. You're just lazy rats. Oh, yes, heaven forbid we celebrate ourselves at more than one point in the year. Um, you know, <laughs> maybe y'all can find a cure for AIDS. Yes, I know several people working on that very topic. Um, and even, uh, you know, within the broader museum community, which is, you know, so I'm at the Natural History Museum, we have Museum Selfie Day. So I posted a picture with my rainbow lanyard and two of what I think are the campus birds. So we've got a Goulian finch in the front and a painted bunting in the back from the Natural History Museum's uh, collection. Uh, and the response was uh, sexualized ornithology, you know, zero decorum. Um, for those interested, my course in sexualized ornithology will be available this autumn uh, through the Open University. Please contact me for details. No. Um, but that, you know, that this, this is still the reaction that, that we get within the science field when you try and bring in parts uh, of your personal life. Um, and I, I just absolutely love this. Um, this comic from uh, from web comic page, like, <laughs> which you know just really epitomizes the very silliness um, of so much of the arguments uh, that some. And so for me, a lot of it is the little thing. So you know, I so I've, I've been married for fifteen years. Um, you know, getting asked what my wife does. I mean, I, I I wear a wedding ring. What does your wife do? Well, my husband. Um, checking into hotel rooms uh, when we both rock up um, after a bit of frantic typing. They say, oh, actually, we, you know, for your um, benefit, we've put you in a room with two twin beds instead of a, instead of a double. Like, mm -hmm. No. Um, and even just song lyrics. You know, think about songs that you hear on the radio um, or, or music that you hear in parts of, of television. And a lot of that is about love and affection and attraction. But how much of that reflects non-cis heterosexual love or attraction. It's very little. Um, and then there's the things that, you know, most straight folks don't really appreciate. You know, walking around, is it safe to hold hands with your significant other? Regularly watching the crowd and, and plotting ways out if you need it. The fact that you've got to think about that. And each of these things on their own isn't fatal, but they each take effort and they each still hurt in their own little way. Speaking of holding hands, this is a report from the EU Fundamental Rights Agency that came out last year. 
Um, and in the UK, more than a third of um, respondents who had same-sex partners didn't hold hands in public for fear of being assaulted, threatened, or, or harassed. A th more than a third. I mean, that's just absolutely staggering. Um, and when you frame it in that way, a lot of folks start to pick up their ears and, and listen to you. But it's also the bigger things. Um, this is from the British Social Attitude Survey, which is a, an every year survey that's run by um, a consortium of, of researchers at universities. And this is uh, specifically looking at the proportion of respondents that said sexual relations between two adults of the same sex is not wrong at all. So you can see back in uh, 1983, which is when I was born, um, it was less than one in five. You know, less than 20% said, yes, this, there's nothing wrong at all with that. Um, and then you can see how that changed, but remained low through the 1980s, up to 2001, where obviously in the UK, they legalized um, equivalent age of consent, and then up to the Civil Partnership Act, and then even marriage in, um, in 2013. But even today, the most recent numbers available are from 2018, even today, there's still not quite 70%. You know, that third of respondents said that there is something wrong with same-sex relationships, which just blows my mind. And that's, again, something that most folks, particularly in, in academic and, and research environments who tend to be um, quite accepting and quite um, socially liberal as a whole, um, don't necessarily appreciate. We also know that queer folks are at bigger risk for poor mental health, um, greater occurrence of, of depression, yes, hello. Um, suicidal thoughts, four times more likely to commit self-harm, have higher alcohol and drug use, more likely to be assaulted. You know, all of these, you know, they're just numbers. Um, when you look at hate crime statistics from, from Britain, you can see that it's not actually going down. Some of this will undoubtedly be reporting bias in early years. But, you know, the fact that more than 2,000 people were uh, reported a hate crime because of something related to their gender identity, and 16,000 reported something um, that was related to their sexual orientation, is... So now um, we'll talk a little bit about plastic pollution. Um, so these might be some of the photos that Jay mentioned at the beginning. What do I do for a living? I make shearwaters vomit bottle caps. Um, so this is a, a flesh-footed shearwater, which is a seabird that breeds off the east coast of Australia. And that's the plastic that we found um, in his stomach, including that lovely uh, Coke bottle lid. When you look actually inside the stomach, you can see it. I mean, that is a bottle cap in a seabird's stomach. When we go to Lord Howe Island, I'm, I'm there with Dr. Jennifer Lavers, who's a, a good friend and collaborator and helps run the Adrift Lab, which is our research group. Um, and you can see some of the plastics there on the, uh, on the... How did this journey start? Well, for me, it started on a Qantas flight um, about 12 years ago. Um, this is the Lord Howe Island Airport and the Qantas Dash 8. It's the shortest commercial runway in the Southern Hemisphere. There's a strict 14 kilo uh, check baggage limit. Um, amazing, amazing place. But flight is really expensive um, because it's a small community. Uh, obviously, you know, there's not many people using that flight, even though it's a great holiday destination. It costs a lot for Qantas to keep that. So the flight is about, you know, six or 700 pounds just for this two and a half hour return flight from Sydney. So, you know, they tend to feed you uh, for free, which you don't get in a lot of Australian domestic food. This was our lunch. Um, so you can see there, we've got uh, a plastic cup, a plastic container full of water. We've got plastic cutlery wrapped in plastic with a plastic wrapped Toblerone bar, a plastic wrapped sandwich and a plastic wrapped clamshell packaging with a plastic wrapped cookie. Um, that's a lot of plastic. And so being scientists, um, we decided when the um, 
flight attendants came around to clear up the garbage, we would just sort of put ours in our uh, in our rucksacks. We took them to the research lab and we weighed them. Um, and it was about 55 grams a person. Just of single use plastic on that one flight. So we can do a little bit of math. 40 people on a flight can fit on a Dash 8. Uh, at the time, there were nine flights a week to Lord Howe Island from Sydney and Brisbane. That's 2.1 tons every year. That's just single use plastic. Plastic that is designed to be used once, to wrap it quickly, and then thrown away and never used again. On this one flight. For me, that was a, that was a real awakening. Numbers on it like that. So, plastic, what is it? Um, natural plastics uh, have been molded and formed for, for millennia, but the first plastic was something called parkasine, cellulose nitrate. And that was, um, yeah, almost a thousand years after St. Nicholas uh, came into existence, which, again, is blowing. But the first sort of real commercial synthetic plastic was called Bakelite. Um, and that was used from the early 20th century up until just after the post-war. Um, and it was, you know, mostly it was black. Um, if you've seen like old um, rubber dial telephones in, in older films, they were made out of Bakelite. But now plastics comprise a huge variety of things. You've got acrylics, um, like you would have in your glasses, polyesters in some of your clothing, silicones in you know, kitchen appliances, polyurethanes, how like, all of these different things are plastics. Um, and if you look at something, uh, it's like a bottle or something at the grocery store, you often see that recycling triangle with the number inside, that actually tells you what kind of plastic it is. So one is polyethylene tetraphthalate or PET. Those are sort of like your drink bottles. Um, but two is this high density polyethylene. And that's like, uh, like the lid on that drink bottle or um, on your, your blue recycling bin that you, um, some of your recycling, that sort of hard, rigid plastic. Um, there's also things called low density polyethylene. Those tend to be your sheet plastics. So, um, think, um, shopping bags, carrier bags, that sort of thing. But then there's this other category, which is the, the other, um, which is basically everything else. And you've got a whole variety of compounds you know, cling film, toothbrush bristles, uh, you know, keyboards, you know, this, this, this mouse is, is ABS, um, polycarbonate and glasses. You know, plastic is not just one thing. It's a whole category of things. And each of them does something differently and affects birds and wildlife in different ways. I really like this quote. This is from Heidi Tate, who runs the Tangaroa Blue Foundation in Australia. And people say, oh yeah, plastic just breaks down in the environment. No, no, it doesn't break down. It just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. Every piece of plastic that was ever produced in the history of humanity that hasn't been burned still exists somewhere in the world today. Each individual piece on their own isn't fatal. It's not gonna kill a bird, but they're not gonna do any good. Having a piece of plastic in a bird does nothing positive and start to see some of the links here in terms of wildlife um the first case of plastic pollution in, in seabirds was documented um gosh 50 more than 50 years ago in the late 1960s um by two researchers from the u.s fish and wildlife service carl kenyon and gene cridler and they found a laysan albatross chick on midway atoll in hawaii um which you can see here in it's got pumice, which are sort of, you know, floating volcanic rocks, but also um, a bunch of plastic in them. Um, and quite interestingly, uh, for me as a seabird and conservation scientist, um, it wasn't until Carl unfortunately passed away um, in 2000, and, I think 2009, uh, and I was reading his obituary in the AUK, which is one of the ornithological research journals. And it mentioned uh, his companion of 39 years, Clarence Larson. Um, his companion. I mean, they, yeah. So for someone that I looked up to professionally, um, you know, for the groundbreaking research they'd done, 
um, I had no idea um, that they were, I would assume, queer or something uh, and had a same sex partner because in science, especially in that time, you just didn't talk about it. And I think we're the poor for that. Now, if you look at lace and albatrosses, let's see how things have changed over time. So there's that data point from, from Carl and Jean's paper. So about three quarters of the chicks had plastic in them. And if we combine that with some data that we collected and, and, and others have as well, um, we can see that by 2010, 11, every single lace and albatross chick has had every single one. Um, and that's where you get images like these, which are taken by, um, which look very similar. So from a research perspective, you can, you've got to sort of step back and think, well, why, why are we still here? Why are we, why did we ignore this for so long? Now, our research in the Adrift Lab is about trying to understand what those plastics do when they're inside of birds. Because, I mean, really, uh, pretty much, if you're only recording birds that die or are dead and have plastic in them, someone asks you how you are, and your two options are alive and dead, doesn't give you a lot of room to, you know, to nuance that at all. Um, so we've been looking at what are called sublethal effects. Um, and we started doing that with um, blood chemistry. So, um, so there I am taking a blood sample from a shearwater, and, and you can see from, from the graphs on the right, birds that have plastic had um, higher calcium in their bloodstream, they had higher cholesterol, they were poor uh, weight, these are chicks, they're all about the same age, they weighed less, they grew slower, so their wings were shorter, um, their bills were shorter, and you can see in the bottom four panels, that it actually relates to the amount of plastics in the bird. So, you know, uric acid and, and amylase are kidney um, and liver function uh, indicators. Um, there's something going on. Now, we don't know exactly what this does, what this means for the bird, because we can't ask the bird how it's feeling. We can only interrogate the data and uh, to, see what, to see what it tells us. Um, but this is the first case of actually linking the amount of plastics in a bird, or even just the presence of plastics. You can see in the top panels. I mean, all it took was for plastic to be present to cause a reduction in calcium and a rise in cholesterol. That could just be one piece. That's all it took. Um, we then sort of synthesized across all, um, all vertebrates. Um, including fish, um, all marine vertebrates, and looked at, you know, how, how, how much do we actually know? So people have seen plastic pollution um, documented on, you know, things like Blue Planet or, you know, with David Attenborough. And you think, oh yeah, we, we've clearly got a handle on this. But actually, when you dig down and look at it, there's only 13 studies which looked at sublethal effects of plastic pollution in vertebrates, in marine vertebrates. Um, most of those are in seabirds, so those are the blue ones there, so, you know, some in land birds, only one in amphibians, only three in reptiles, you know, so there's a lot that we still have learned about this global problem. It is really a global problem. So this is, you know, perhaps one of my favorite places in the world. This is smack dab in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. Um, the blue circles that you see there, that's the, uh, the seas around the Pitcairn Islands. It's a UK overseas territory, um, home to about 50 people, descendants from uh, the Mutiny on the Bounty, uh, which some of you may, may, may know, you know, written by Captain William Bly. 1793, there was a mutiny on HMS Bounty. Um, the mutineers took the ship, landed at Pitcairn, um, and their community persists uh, to this day. And that black dot is Henderson Island. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it's a raised coral atoll, one of only two in the world, 43 square kilometers. And it is, I mean, it's got five endemic bird species found nowhere else in the world. You know, there's a lorikeet, which has fantastic purple trousers. Um, there's a fruit dove, there's a reed warbler. Um, you know, there's a, there's a petrel. 
It's absolutely, and there's a crate, a rail. And it's phenomenal. It's this amazing island. Um, and I was lucky enough to go there in 2019 uh, for an expedition. Because a few years before, I managed from the UK an expedition that went to the island, um, came across something quite, yeah, quite remarkable. So here you can see, you know, the you know incredibly dense vegetation. You need a machete to cut trails through the through the top of the plateau, and you can see our research ship there, the Silver Supporter. Um, because it's such a difficult place to get to, there's only been a few expeditions there, and so we contacted um, some folks. That there in 1991, which is part of a 13 month expedition to the Pitcairn Islands. They sent us this picture of East Beach. So, um, so East Beach, as you can imagine, is on the east side of the island. Um, the next island sort of, you know, basically if you go east from Henderson, the next place you'll hit are the Easter Islands and then the coast of Chile. It is properly in the middle of nowhere. And you can see, you know, it's a fantastic beach. There's some sand, some coral rubble. You can see the waves breaking there across the reef. Absolutely gorgeous. And when we went there in 2015, we found covered in plastic debris. Everything from fishing crates, buoys, fragments, bottles, containers, you name it. And at the time, um, and we published this in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, it was the most polluted island that had yet been done. On this two kilometer beach, there were 38 million pieces weighing 17 tons. The thing about Henderson is nobody lives there. It's 5,000 kilometers from anywhere with a substantial population. So why is all this rubbish there? And you can see, you know, on the left, you've got, um, there's the beach. You've got a hermit crab living in an Avon cosmetics bottle. You can see um, fishing net. Um, and, and line tangled on some of the corals, tangled on some of the green sea turtle there in the bottom left. And then the thing that really struck with, uh, that really stuck us, struck us, stuck with us in the bottom right panel is the fact that there were basically a thousand additional items showing up with each tide every day. And the thing about Henderson is that it's smack dab in what's called the South Pacific Gyre. So there are five oceanic gyres in the world, which are these large surface currents that concentrate floating debris. You may have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That's the North Pacific Gyre. There's one in the North and South Pacific, the North and South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. And smack dab in the middle of the one in the South Pacific, which you can see there is Henderson. And it's pulling debris in from all over the world. You know, we found debris from where one might expect, Australia, New Zealand, um, Chile, United States, but also China, Japan, Spain, Scotland. Um, you know, 22 countries, we recorded some identifiable piece of debris. But the thing is, you know, most of it is just these small fragments, which you, you have no idea what they were or how long they've been in the ocean. So why is this actually a bad thing? Well, when we were there in 2019, we noticed um, a lot of bottles had these shells in them. And when we started investigating that, it turns out that they were dead hermit crabs, small hermit crabs. Hermit crabs don't have their own shells. So they rely on nicking the shells of you know, gastropods and other other animals that are done with them or have already passed. Um, what happens is, you know, these containers are like the perfect environment for hermit crabs because you know, they're, they're warm. They're humid, um, they're just absolutely wonderful. So what happens is a hermit crab goes in, um, but then because it's a plastic bottle, he can't get back out because the surface is just so smooth. He can't get purchase and climb back out, so it dies. Really insidious thing with hermit crabs is that when one dies, it emits a chemical signal that tells all of its friends, hey, there is a free shell available. So another one comes in and dies, and another, and another, and another, and another. So in this plastic bottle, which you can see here in the middle, that's an agricultural pesticide bottle. 526 hermit crabs. And we estimated that between Henderson Island and the Cocos Keeling Islands in Australia, in the Indian Ocean, which has a similar problem, 
um, there were 600,000 dead hermit crabs just sitting in discarded bottles or containers. And that has huge implications for how beach ecosystems work because these are the animals that are, you know, going and, and dealing with any, you know, other dead animals. They're, they're scavenging, they're turning over the soil, the sand. Um, they're real ecosystem engineers, we call them. Also, the plastics physically affect the sand itself. In 2019, we put um, temperature sensors on uh, on sticks and buried them in the sand in places that had different amounts of plastic on them. And in particular, you look at the top uh, left panel, and that's the temperature at five centimeters. And what you can see is that at a medium density of plastics, um, the daily minimum and maximum, the variance around that is much greater. Um, so it's not insulating. Um, and it's, 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 it's basically, it's, it's physically affecting the, the properties of the beaches. And that's got implications for a lot of animals because they have what's called sex dependent, temperature dependent sex determination, which means depending on the temperature of the sand, that will determine whether, um, in particular, you know, something like sea turtles, whether they hatch as, as male or female. we do about it? Um, I've got four things listed here. I'm going to start at the bottom though, personal changes. I mean, this is one of the things that was sort of touted early on, uh, you know, how do we combat plastic pollution? You know, everyone, you know, bring your reusable shopping bags, get a bamboo toothbrush, all the devices. And yes, they do add up, but it's also a way of passing off that larger corporate responsibility onto individual consumers. Really what we need is that international cooperation because once plastic gets into the ocean, it goes absolutely everywhere. You know, that's why we were finding containers and bottles from, from Spain and Scotland in the middle of the South Pacific, you know, 20,000 kilometers away. And what this plot shows, so the, the gray line that you see there, um, that's the change in carbon emissions. All the blue is plastic production and it's literally increasing exponentially. Um, and if you look at the agreements that we've put in place to combat climate change, which you can see in the gray boxes, you've got the Rio Agreement in 92, and that was the first to really say, I think climate change and CO2 is going to be an issue. You've got Kyoto five years later, which was, you know, non-binding targets. And then you've got Paris Agreement um, just six years ago, which was actually binding targets. And if you look at plastic pollution, the first um, indication that there was something was, was MARPOL, which can, governs dumping at sea, 1978. Um, but then even up through the Honolulu strategy, Rio plus 20 meeting and the Clean Seas meeting, we're still at the, we think this might be an issue stage. So com compared with climate change on the international stage, we're 30 years behind. And look where we are with climate change and how much more we have to do. And to get there, it's going to require a lot of political engagement. And we're seeing more and more of that, but also public pressure, both on governments, on communities, and on, cons um, on companies to make their products not only more sustainable, but also more affordable. A lot of plastic alternatives are more expensive. And so there's also a financial uh, hurdle to overcome. Um, yes, you're, if, if you're on a limited income, you're going to buy the cheaper toothbrush. I mean, there's no way around that. And looking globally, we've got um, these uh, 17 goals called the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which includes number 14, life below water. One of the sub goals of that was to reduce the amount of plastic pollution in the ocean um, by 2020. Not reduced by how much, we're not even gonna make it as with most of these international aspirational agreements. Right now, um, countries are negotiating what's gonna follow the SDGs. Um, which will see uh, progress over the next decade. Um, so we'll wait and see. Yeah, we'll wait and see, but I'm not going to hold my breath. And just like um, I mentioned earlier about my own personal experiences, it's these little things that add up. So during this talk, 300,000 plastic items will enter the ocean. 90% of these will be from consumer products. And the vast majority of those will be designed to, uh, were designed to be used once, then discarded. 
Plastics are a non-renewable resource. They come from oil um, and petrochemicals. And the thing is, you know, constantly checking products for the amount of plastic they've got is both tiring and incredibly saddening. So how do we link up these two threads? How can we queer our plastic conservation science? Well, there's a fantastic thing called the Queer Science Manifesto, which posits several, um, several things, but what, what queer science actually, you know, what, what, what is it? Um, and these in particular um, really struck with me. So it's all inclusive, it's angry and political, um, and it's full of unapologetic agendas. Science is not completely objective. Um, and, and it never has been. Anyone who tells you that it is, is lying through the seat of their pants. Um, queer science doesn't just go to the moon. It insists that people with any kinds of bodies can dream of being astronauts. It stops science um, being for the polite uh, and only for the good kids and makes it radical and interrupting. And that's ultimately what we need. Um, because if we just sit in our ivory towers and talk about um, you know, changes in circadian temperature levels and particulate sediments. Um, huh, yeah, okay, fine. But when we talk about what we've got to do to stop sand from getting too hot from all the plastic that we're chucking into the ocean, um, you know, that has a very different message. In the Adrift Lab, we've really adopted this. So we celebrate um, collaboration and community over individualism and ego. We work with a lot of local communities to deliver the science and the research that they need to deliver their agendas. Um, and it constantly questions and fights for a more just world. I mean, that's ultimately why we're interested in this. Um, here is the link. You can just Google Queer Science Manifesto and it will come up. And it's really the ethos of the Adrift Lab um, and, and how we try and approach the research that we do. And to me, uh, I only discovered this about four or five years ago, and it just made instant sense. And when I show this to some of my straight colleagues, they still get really uncomfortable, but it just, it just clicks for whatever reason. Um, and I think it's the way that we need to be doing science and, and research. Um, I can't imagine it doing, doing it any other way. And part of the reason why I get very shouty about science and rainbows and, and, and queer people is because it's not particularly great being uh, queer in STEM. So this is the results of a, a climate survey done by the Royal Astronomical Society, the Royal Society for Chemistry and the Institute of Physics that looked at um, the physical sciences. So, um, you know, chemistry, physics, astronomy, um, you know, that sort of thing, engineering. Um, and, you know, 28% of LGBTQ respondents considered leaving science for some reason, um, compared with only 16%. Um, and for trans folks, that's, you know, one in five. Are you, are you out at work? Yes, I, so I am out at work, but, I, you know, it's a very privileged place to be. I, I have been out at work for more than a decade, but every time that's a decision. Um, you know, only 14% of buy or pan folks are out at work in science. Um, only 44% of, of people who identified as gay, which, you know, is the most privileged of the rainbow identities, really, um, is, is really shocking. Um, you know, 20% of experienced exclusionary behavior. 40% working outside academia, so you know, I'm in a museum, didn't have access to a workplace support network. You know, part of the challenge, and this is not just in the physical sciences, but in the biological sciences as well, well, any field of science, is you never quite know when you're being slighted because of something you did or of who you are. That for me has always been a really tricky thing to, to navigate. Um, this is a research paper that just came out earlier this year that looked at you know, basically, there, there are systemic inequalities 
uh, for queer professionals in in STEM. So, you know, queer folks in STEM uh, have uh, fewer career opportunities. They often uh, don't have enough resources. They're less comfortable whistleblowing compared to their straight colleagues. Um, they feel uh, they're more likely to feel devalued in their professional lives. Um, and they feel more socially excluded in professional um, They've experienced significantly more harassment in the workplace, and they've got um, greater uh, likelihood of reporting minor health problems, insomnia, uh, work-related stress, or, or depressive symptoms. For a lot of us, that is like, well, yes, obviously, but you know, science is all about quantifying the obvious in some cases, um, and this is just one example of that. Why do I get shouty? Well, for me, it's because visibility and representation really matter a lot. And we harp on a lot about this, but I think it's really important. When we ran the LGBT seminar, which is our one day science conference uh, for LGBTQ plus folks in STEM, it's not about being LGBTQ plus in science. It's about those queer folks presenting their science in a safe and welcoming environment. Um, you know, these are some of the comments that we got back. You know, one of the most profound experiences of my life. Um, and, and the last one in, in particular, this was when we held our, our event at the Institute of Physics building in London, which had a giant, one of those giant multi-panel television screens. We had a rainbow flag up. Um, and somebody said, you know, I've got to say, I was a bit choked up when I walked in and saw that massive rainbow. It overwhelmed me to walk into a room and feel so immediately validated and completely welcoming. Do that in your professional life. Someone said to me, like, do you remember what it felt like the first time you saw a queer person really owning it and giving you the confidence to be yourself? You, and in the broad you, not me, but you know, you are that person to someone. If we look internationally, um, there's a lot of discrimination around for queer folks. This is a map from um, ILGA, which shows laws uh, relating to the criminality of homosexuality. Um, basically, red, red and orange are, are bad, where it's you know, literally illegal to be gay, most often gay, less so lesbian or trans, um, in about 70 countries worldwide. And these are some of the things that my straight colleagues don't necessarily think about. When someone says, oh yeah, there's this fantastic conference that you should go to um, in Namibia. Mm, probably not going to happen. Um, I interviewed for a job at a university where it was only at the interview I found out one of the requirements would be to teach the international field course in Ghana. Not going to take that job. Um, and when you overlay this map with the map of visitors to the LGBTQ plus STEM blog where we post interviews with queer scientists, We've had, uh, I mean, this is about a year old now, so we've had, you know, 120,000 page views. 1% of those are from countries where being queer is illegal. It doesn't matter that it's 1%. It could be one, and it would still be absolutely worth every effort. Because when I say visibility and representation matter, what I mean is when we get messages on Twitter this. Hello, how are you? I'm gay from Iraq. I need help. When someone reaches out like that, you must reach back. Moral obligation for those of us um, in these positions of you know, organizing and, and, and organizations. I can safely you know, report now that this person is no longer in Iraq and is in a safe third country. That really hits you. And it's really hard to explain what this does to my straight colleagues in much the same way that it's very hard to explain and experience the eco grief around studying plastic pollution for a decade and a half. Yes, we've seen the troops, but in, we've heard repeatedly from people that we bring to the field until you are actually there and witness it with your own eyes don't appreciate how awful it really is. But to try and wrap up, um, 
talk a little bit about queer leadership. And it's not just in science. Um, and the thing is, every queer person is a leader. Just don't know it yet. Um, and the best way to do this, and this is the honestly the best piece of advice I ever got, and so I'll pass it along, is to be the person you wish you had in your own mind. I was a graduate student, even an undergraduate student, even a high school student. I didn't know any other, I didn't have any queer mentors. I didn't meet another out LGBTQ plus scientist until the third year of my PhD. That's nine years into post-secondary education. They were a visiting speaker. They weren't even within my own institution. I mean, they were definitely there. I didn't know that. I think most importantly, stay safe and build support in these communities because it is exhausting. Um, it's just like checking the amount of plastic. Now, yeah, I wanted to close with um, not quite a prophetic vision, but you know, what does the future have in store? As yes, things are tough right now, especially, but they are trending to the positive. Things are better now than they were. Yes, there will be lags, there will be dips, there will be steps backwards, as there always are. Um, and I think we're in one of those in the UK in particular right now, both in terms of accepting, not accepting, integrating and celebrating LGBTQ plus folks, but also how we approach and view scientific evidence and scientific experts. And it's important to both call out the bad, but also build the good. Calling out the bad, yes, it's essential, we've got to do it. But the better thing to do for communities is to build and empower people to go forward uh, and build more. Um, and lastly, things are easier and I dare say quicker when you've got supportive, diverse, and inclusive communities. And that can be a university department, it can be a church congregation, it can be a research lab. Um, those are the communities that will see us through those, those dips and those troughs. So I'll close with um, a few acknowledgements to folks that have helped with science, with um, running LGBTQ plus STEM, um, and, and just being fantastic, wonderful. As good science, queer science, happens because of good people. Thank you for watching this video. We hope that you've gained something from what Alex has shared with us, that you go away slightly changed and with a lot to think about. The next video in the St. Nicholas Summer Series is with Reverend Benjamin Perry from Middle Collegiate Church in New York City. Just like St. Nick's, Middle is a radically inclusive and affirming church, and we're really looking forward to what Ben has to say about faith spaces, faith communities, and queerness. From everyone at St. Nick's, I just want to say thank you, bless you, and goodbye until next time.